you're uh, new to us, my name is Per Rademacher. With me is Harold Smith. He's the author of the articles on he that has an ear.com website. And what we do each week is we have a little discussion and we talk about one of the articles. And so we're throwing in a series here that's appropriate for the fall. Um, it's a three-part series, Fall Festivals of Israel series is what it's being called. The first one is Yom Teruah, Teruah? Teruah. Teruah, Yom Teruah, Awakening Blast. So that's our first article in the series. And we always preface our discussions with this, read the article. Uh, we don't cover all the things in them. There's links to scripture verses, word definitions, other articles that, you know, connect the information or expound. And then other times, once in a while, there's links to extra curriculum material off Harold's website that will allow you to get a deeper insight into some of the concepts that he's building his articles around or writing his articles around. So this one is one of those articles, as I mentioned before we started talking, Harold, uh, Yom Teruah. Uh, which is part one, three-part series in this article series. Um, you know, this is one of those articles where you take apart religious tradition and how it's being used either in Christianity or Judaism and show that literally entire doctrine or religious concepts are created that have absolutely nothing to do with scripture. And these aren't necessarily uh, big, huge aha articles, but they're really integral to understanding all the little pieces that when you add them up where there is erroneous teaching or false translation or erroneous translation, um, where people end up off the track. And by knocking these, you know, posts down, gradually people start getting a framework of what is true. And, and I think this, for this reason, this kind of article is really exceptional. So with that, uh, Yom Teruah, how would you like to start it today? What you said is really important. Um, we, have to, we have to understand that most of our framework that we operate in is given to us by um, extraneous sources. If we are really wanting to pursue truth across the board, we need to look at these words and, and all of the words from the Hebraic perspective that they're written in by Hebrews who came to this perspective out of a Hebrew culture that they were immersed in all their lives. You know, these people were not writing these words for a generation, two or three thousand years in the future. They were, they were put down primarily for other Hebrews who understood the nuances of the Hebrew language um, to to convey certain aspects of the nature of Yahweh to these Hebrew people. Now, once we become uh, attached to this kingdom, grafted in, if you will, that doesn't mean, and a lot of people believe this, <laughs> They act it, even, even if they don't say it. It doesn't mean that the kingdom begins to move according to how we think it should be. It's like in, in any other country of the world. When you go to another country uh, to live, you obey the regulations of that country. You don't you don't say, well, that's not the way it is in the States, although you might. You know, when I was in Israel, I'd say, well, that's not the way it's in the States. And the police officer, uh, officer said, too bad, buddy. <laughs> you know, um, but when you're, when you're in Yahweh's kingdom, you want to be able to uh, 
abide in that kingdom by keeping his words, keeping the uh, instructions for how to live in the kingdom. I'm saying all of this because what this article does primarily is to help people make that switch from this English Christian, Christianized culture to the Hebraic culture that these words are presented in. And one of the, one of the things that I've begun to see is how Christianity particularly, now Judaism does it too, and we'll see that here in a minute, but Christianity has a, has a, a way of taking these events and words and redefining them to their, to their own agenda. And, and if you don't think Christianity has an agenda, um, you probably don't need to be watching these videos. <laughs> but it does, as, as does every other man-made religion in the world. All of them. They're all man-made. And Judaism is, is, no, um, is no different. Um, most people in our Christian culture, you know, that particularly these days, there's a, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, getting back to the Hebrew roots. And the problem that, that most are encountering is that what they are getting, what they are perceiving to be Hebrew roots are really just the um, English components of the religion of Judaism. For instance, um, everybody wants to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. And according to Judaism, Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of what's known as the Days of Awe, and in which you have, beginning with um, Rosh Hashanah, and then you have Yom Kippur, and... Um, First of all, the, these days of awe, this week that is celebrated, is not in Scripture. Nowhere to be found. In fact, Rosh Hashanah is not in Scripture. Nowhere to be found. Now, I'm not talking about the, some of the English versions, but I'm talking about the Hebrew uh, because the words don't appear in Hebrew. Um, it, it just doesn't exist anywhere in Scripture. Uh, the Feast of Yom Turah has been hijacked by this rabbinical religion of Judaism, and they changed it from the scriptural Yom, Tur Yom, Turah, <coughs> Yom Turah to Rosh Hashanah, and the reason it was changed was purely political reasons within the realm of Judaism at the time. Um, I'm not going to go into the background of it here. You can do research on the on the internet, and you can find out for yourself what that is because it's pretty well uh, acknowledged. Although it's acknowledged, <laughs> nobody changes it back. You know, it just it's. It's there and it becomes entrenched. And so what this does is should bring to our attention that in order to understand these words and find the truth of the nature of Yahweh in them, we have to be able to scrape away 
the religious traditions of men, which includes the religion of Judaism and the religion of Christianity and the messianic religion that tries to combine the two. Uh, and just get back to what these words say and mean on their own, which means we have to do some research. We have to do some digging. We have to spend some time with the Father, first of all, so we hear his voice, so he can guide us and direct us as to which way to go. But as we're going through these, these scriptures and digging down to the original languages to find out what they truly say and mean, um, for me, it's just an exciting adventure. I, I, I get into one of these articles and I start over here and I wind up over here and I look at, at you know, what I thought was it was in the beginning and the father's just taking me through these words and showing me different things until I get over here to the true meaning of what they, what they, what they are. Another thing about Yom Terah is there is a constituency among Messianic um, believers, followers, uh, and I'm talking about the religious uh, conclaves of, of people, and that is that there, there's, a, there's a section that absolutely believes that this whole idea of uh, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah, wherever they, they, they are, is dependent on the sighting of the crescent moon. And here's why. All of the, all of the, the feasts in Torah all have specific dates upon which they um, uh, are celebrated. The only exception to those is Yom Teruah. And it's because, Teruah, and it's because um, that feast cannot take place until the new moon. Now, <clears throat> Here's where we have to get back into Hebrew culture and understanding to understand why this is a problem. Whenever, you, whenever uh, the, the Hebrew calendar is based mostly on the, the moon, the lunar cycle, it's called a lunar calendar. And every month in the, he, every Hebrew month has either 29, or 30 days. They're not the same. And the reason being is because they're all dependent on the sighting of the new moon. So you have you have the sun here and 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 the moon passes before the sun and and when it gets darkened that is actually the new moon. Now there's a crescent passing into this stage, and then there's a crescent passing out of that stage, but the actual new moon is in between. Now, we're, we, we wait upon until we see the, the first crescent in the, in the night sky to understand that that new moon has happened, but the celebration and the observances surrounding the crescent is not scriptural. What, what the, the, the ancients were celebrating was that day. It wasn't that new moon, which if we're not careful, we get into a situation um, where we begin worshiping the moon or the crescent um, as um, an idol or another god, and we're we're specifically um, told in scripture uh, in uh, Deuteronomy four nineteen 
uh, not to do that. So the moon is a is a is a sign of a season, and a season is not necessarily winter, spring, summer, and fall. A season is, <clears throat> for instance, in this in this case of Yom Teruah, it's it's the season of that day. We're 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 looking at that day for a celebration of the new moon. Now the reason that that and this is and this is the reason why Yom Teruah doesn't have a specific date in the Hebrew calendar because some days it may show up on the 29th, some days it may show up on the 30th, and some days it may show up in between. You just never know because this this event it, it floats. It's not a static deal. And but all of the other feasts in the month, in the seventh month, are dependent on when that that day of the new moon is set. Because if you're if you're celebrating uh, Yom Kippur in the fifteenth of the month, well, you can't know where that is until the first day is set. And and the same with uh, the the um, Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's it's an important event. Uh, Christianity has also renamed uh, Yom Teruah to the Feast of Trumpets, but that's not what Teruah means. Teruah means an awakening blast or an awakening shout, and uh, I show in the article. But there are other instances in the noun form, that's the verb form, in the noun form, where it's given to people, shouting. For instance, in uh, Joshua 9, 6, uh, where the uh, Israelites were walking around the, the wall, they were blowing trumpets, but it was their shout that caused those walls to come down. And so when we, when we look at the name of Teruah, it means an awakening blast. It's an awakening because it's telling us when the first of this month begins and it's doing it with a shout. And um, there are indications in several places in scripture uh, where it's also referred to as Zikron Teruah. Um, and the word Zikron, um, it, in, in, most, um, in most of our English versions, it's translated as memorial, uh, but this, this word means to mention, often in reference to speaking the name of Yahweh. Um, the day of Zikron, Zikron Teruah, uh, the the mentioning shout is 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 how that's translated into English. Uh, may refer to a day of gathering in public prayer, in which the crowd of the faithful shouts the name of Yahweh uh, in unison. Thus, thus a time of gathering within the temple uh, to praise His name, and. You know, most of us just haven't taken the time to sit down and go through this stuff um, to find out what the what these things mean. Because, as my friend Brett said to me, coming into this article, <laughs> this stuff's just boring, <laughs> and and it's true. It doesn't have the fireworks. <laughs> it, you know, um, it, it's. It's one of those things, it's one of those things where you're aware that there's an importance to understanding it, but as a general rule, it takes somebody like you to dig out and ferret and connect those dots and pieces, because I don't think everybody's wired to do that in order to have... Uh, the leading or, or gifting to put those or, or hearing it for that matter. So, you know, that in and of itself 
uh, makes it a lot more palatable. But there's, there's, there's pieces in your writings that I think you kind of set up other writings by laying the foundation of understanding, like, you know, the feasts, what's really important, what's not important, what's man ordained, what did Yahweh really intend, you know, what, like, just the fact that this, the, the little nuance of where people are not focusing on what's actually happened, but the actual physical element of the crescent moon, and all of a sudden that becoming, you know, and if I recall correctly, so much so isn't there a religion with a little crescent on it right so so right right uh hey uh, you never know where the thing the, those those tangents lead right so uh, if that's not a warning <laughs> i don't know what is um for those with eyes to see you know pay attention to those clues of of what's going on there because a lot of times within those little clues is a framework that you really need to be paying attention to, right? It's not necessarily this piece of information, but it's where this overall component fits in to a better understanding of, of truth and your walk. Perfect example of, you know, you conclude your article at the end, you know, I, I know I'm jumping ahead, but you've done this in other places where, you know, a lot of these feasts that are trying to be replicated today either by you know people that are following judaism as a religion or the messianic not so much christianity but messianics messianic movement within christianity are chasing after these things and putting them on a pedestal and i've watched it firsthand i i literally lived in a community where this was a big part of this and I always kind of had a peripheral outside view of it because I felt most of it was going off tangent. And you can see really quickly when you're around a bunch of people that are, that are into this, they're simply replacing one kind of ritual for another. Exactly. And, and, and they think because it's sugar coated with some rabbinical uh, words or some Hebraic music or uh, instruments of, you know, service, for example, communion or however they're doing it uh, for the Passover, it's no different. It's just another ritual. And, and most of these people are not seeing past what these were meant to convey differently than they are now. And what they are now is actually representations of what we're to be currently walking in not some foreshadow of something to come in most cases and and not something that's just done to be ritualized so we're carrying out some priestly duty so we look <clears throat> like we're virtuous right it's like i i, I was kind of raised catholic i say that because i don't think it did a good job and i really wasn't immersed into it but i you know i went to catholic school a few times growing up and i was an altar t boy a few times growing you know i got fired twice as an altar boy i'm probably the only person you've ever met that's been fired twice as an <laughs> altar boy just for general goofing off you know nothing nothing you know uh <laughs> scandalous but just being a boy but the point is is that when you, when you see those things from, say, a Catholic point of view, and then you see them from a Christian point of view with many different flavors, um, you know, Messianic all the way to, you know, Anti-Baptist to Pentecost. I mean, I've seen it all, man. I've, I've walked into so many different churches and flavors, you wouldn't believe it. I, I have no problem walking in any church just to check it out. I don't do it anymore, but there was a time where, uh, I definitely saw the inside of a lot of different flavors of Christianity and, and also on the Jewish side. So I've seen all these. Why? Well, you know, trying to check it out, see where truth hangs out. <laughs> Most times it ain't there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of doors to walk through trying to figure this thing out. And the more you walk through, there's a couple things that you learn. There's a lot of similarities between all these flavors and, but one of the biggest similarities is they've got all their little rules and rituals and mindsets 
that are, as a general rule have been shaped by man-made philosophy and tradition. And that's what it boils down to. And for me, it just simply got to a place of seeing this replicated over and over again with different veneers. And when you've seen this some dozens of times, I'm not talking like, you know, comparing, well, I'm talking dozens of times. I mean, I had no problem checking out what's behind door number one, door number two, door number three. And, and when you walk that journey out after a while, you're like going, you know what? The biggest similarity I see here is none of them are doing what they're trying to do. <laughs> well, it's, That's the, it's all the same spirit of religion. I, 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 but, but I want to just, I just, the, the crazy thing, Harold, is it's, they're all doing basically the same thing, and that's dodging the real thing. You know, they've got a masterful way of recreating reality and bending it to work to where if you strategically take verses and align them a certain way or translate them a certain way or um, frame them a certain way by how you position them within your story, you can get a completely different storyline. Right? You, can, right? you can get one storyline with this flavor of Christianity. You can get this storyline with this flavor of Judaism. You can even pull out storylines to justify being an atheist and an agnostic, right? Or just a, a, a plain out rebellious, you know, sinner. I mean, you know, you can guys say, what's the point? Look at these, look at these, they're impossible to do. Screw it, I'm out of here. I'm just gonna be a sinner. I've seen it all. I've seen people use every variation of scripture to come up with some kind of uh, justification for their position. And, and so, especially when you're dealing with people that are well-versed in the Bible, that's like the last argument you want to have. Because as a general rule, these, these, these verses and this mindset and this philosophy is so embedded. And this can happen to anybody, by the way. You know, anytime, you know, uh, Nazism was built on the fact that you could tell a lie big enough and long enough and get a lot of people to believe it. And they bragged about it. And, 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 and Joseph Gold, listen to this. This is crazy. This is a side note, but it just gives you an idea of the power of influence to change your mind so that you don't, that you believe something that's not true. Joseph Goebbels was the guy behind the Nazi propaganda machine. His his source of inspiration was from Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was a nephew of Sigmund Freud. Edward Bernays is considered the father of, of public relations, modern day, but, but another term for that back then was propaganda. So you have to understand whether it's government, whether it's religion, whether it's advertising, there's a framework that's being put on everything. Your kid's education, the thing that's being sold to you, you know, your flavor of religion that you like because it makes you feel warm and fuzzy. I'm telling you, when you get to the place where you finally realize that all these big bad boys are painted over with a delusion illusion <laughs> that is not uh, in alignment with what Yahweh has created, and this world that you're supposed to operate in, when you finally get really clear, you'll, you'll get serious about this walk. But until you get to the place where you realize all this stuff that's been pulled around your eyes is basically malarkey, and you yourself are not even qualified to um, separate that distinction. It's only by Yahweh leading you that you can truly see this at his pleasure, at his leisure. It's not a push button command thing like the word of faith people would have you believe or, or you know, memorize a Bible verse or, or get your doctrine down and all of a sudden, or go preach the gospel and put your notches in your cross of how many people you've brought to salvation. I mean, when you, when you finally realize that all that is just malarkey, then you can have a serious conversation not only with yourself, but with your creator. <laughs> Well, and this is this is part of the reason why uh, we're, we we bring these articles up like this is because uh, to to expose this religious um, agenda that that these groups have, 
the purpose is to, you know, bring people more into their tent. So they'll put more money in the plate and, you know, they can live with gold plated faucets in their bathroom. Um, but that's not why scripture was given to us. And we need to understand that, that most of the messianics are trying to replicate as as are uh, as as is the religion of Judaism trying to re replicate the 613 ordinances that are found in the Torah, and the 613 were given to a specific people at a specific time for a specific purpose uh, to address specific issues that were taking place among this specific people that was out in a specific wilderness uh, and and trying to bring some order to Paul, oh, can you be any more specific? <laughs> well, but, 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 you, but the point is, the point what you're trying to make is, listen, a lot of people use the just, and, and I, I get what they're saying because they don't have an understanding of what, what you just said. But a lot of people use within those ordinances a reason not to believe in God. You know, the fact that you would stone your own child for being rebellious or whatever other thing in there that they felt does not fit their framework of justice or what a, a, a loving God should be. They take that and use, they'll take one scripture verse and, you know, whether they do this knowingly or unknowingly, they're just playing spiritual judo, right? They're just looking for this. They're, they're, it's not that they want to have a real conversation about God. It's not that they even want to find out the truth. They just want to take one little piece that conveniently allows them to flip, you know, the narrative around so they can just slam it down, one and done. I don't believe this garbage. Thank you very much. And being about as lazy as you can be about looking at reality. And that's, that's the truth, right? That's the culture we live in. Well, these articles are not addressed so much to those guys because they're, they're not. Be, these guys, these guys won't even, as a general. Exactly. And so what we're dealing with here are people that are trying to live by these words through the filter of whatever religious bent that they're, that they're attached to. The problem we get into with the six, particularly with these 613 ordinances is that about a third of them address um, the temple, the Levitical um, uh, sacrifices, the, the, the service of the Levitical priests, how all of this, these sacrifices are to be done. And the truth is, they can't be. They can't be accomplished because we don't have a physical a temple. A physical temple. And and, and that did it, that in and of itself lends a problem to the whole concept of trying to keep those right. That in and of itself. So so then, what do you do with that? And and I think it that is a very uh, much a point validation of the comment you made earlier about this was for a specific time, place, and people. So what happens when you get in, particularly in the Messianic movement, is these guys are trying to abide by these words, abide by these rules. And like I said, about a third of them can't be done. And my question, and, and there's not, I haven't run across a messianic yet that doesn't understand that the temple uh, has been translated and now abides within um, his people <clears throat> of those that uh, receive him, receive Yahweh for who he says he is and Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel. They don't have a problem with that concept, but they're still trying to hang on to the other two thirds and, and bring them into reality uh, through these rules and regulations. And a, a perfect example of that is 
these feasts. Uh, they are included in these 613. And my question is, if we, if we understand that this third of these ordinances can't be done, why are we still trying to, uh, to keep the other two thirds as though that, as though they- well, You know, here's, here's, you know, again, because I was out actively trying to figure things out and, and, and connecting with people from different persuasions and flavors of their religious Christian, Christian theology for the most part. So when, when you're doing that, you're trying to figure out one of the key things that I feel like I, I felt like as, I, I, as a general, I'm somebody who likes to look under the rock, right? Would you consider yourself somebody who likes to look under the rock, right? No, I want to blow it up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But, 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 but there's people that will look at the rock and they go, oh, there's a pretty rock, right? And, and, and then there's people that look at the rock and go, oh, it's this kind of rock. And then there's the guy that, like, I want to see what's under the rock. And then you're, like, one step further. Let's smash it and, you know, whatever. But, but the point being, there's a lot of people that just superficially walk by in life. Everything is just and – I, and I think even more so today with our modern culture – fast food, fast food information, social media, everything is bite-sized, dumbed down, you know, no critical thinking, just bypass, load it into your brain, live fairly uh, unconsciously, right? So as a result of that, people don't take a look at what their belief systems actually mean. They don't take, a, they, they don't want to look at, okay, like your religion specifically is doing things that it says in scripture you shouldn't be doing how do you come up with that you know it's like where, where's the connect and as a general rule this is what i found from most of the people leading all the way up to what would we call you know elders or leadership or pastors most of them just don't have a clue and they're winging it and um on the hard issues they simply tap dance and the tap dance could be the party line whatever it is for that denomination, or it could be uh, suck it up, brother, you need more faith, or it's a mystery, right? It's usually one of those kind of things. Here's the party line, you know, um, you know, you got to walk it on faith, or, you know, it's a mystery, or you'll hear uh, some convoluted um, explanation of something that you can tell when it's all said and done, they don't get it, right? So I think a lot of people need to go back to what Yeshua said, you know, when he said, let the dead bury the dead. You got to get to a place where you start learning enough about where there's a lot of bullet holes in your belief system based on the truth of scripture that you start to realize that the guy standing up in the pulpit probably doesn't know what he's talking about. And until you get to the place where you're like that, you're giving this guy a level of credibility and authority in your life that he does not rightfully have. And I know that's a strong word, but when you sit in front of a guy week after week and you listen to what he says and you're taking it in his truth or you're trying to filter out what is truth, when number one, either it's not truth or it's got a lot of holes in it, the bottom line, you've put somebody in a position of your li in your life that's speaking into you in place of Yahweh. And that's where you have a problem. And that's where you have a problem. And until you realize that's a problem, and if you continue to sit in that place of instruction where that authority overrides truth, you got a problem. <laughs> so that's, that's what I would like to say about all this is because because this has been my journey. I recognized there was a problem. I saw there was a huge discrepancy about what the scripture was saying and what was, either the party line is for that denomination of Christianity or, or that church. And, and then, and, you know, what the pastor was saying versus what I felt like the spirit was saying. And you got to get to a place where you say, man, this is systematic. This is not just one church. This is not just one denomination. This is systemic. And we, when you get to that place, then all of a sudden you, you have to realize that you, as in you listening to this, are accountable for who you're allowing to speak into your life, right? 
right? And, and I just feel all these discussions really are, they're just kind of like clues. They're like pricks. This isn't, I, I, and, and Harold, Harold says this intermittently throughout, you know, his writings. You know, he's not here to be the ultimate source of truth. This is what he's gotten. This is, this is what has been given to him. This is what he's sharing. And he has to work for it. You know, he's got to go study. He's got to put the pieces together. He's not getting it on a silver platter. You know, and I've been there. We, we actually had an article that came uh, uh, to us. I mean, Harold wrote, Harold wrote it out. But it, the, the concept and the, the thing that came to us was a result of one of our discussions. But it was like, poop, it just dropped in out of nowhere. And, and, but we both picked up on it. And Harold fleshed it out in an article. But that's the thing here is if you're not listening to Yahweh directly and, and these articles are not uh, prompting you to, to move into that channel of listening, then you got a problem in general, <laughs> period, right? And, 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 and the other side of this equation is you got to get to the place where you firm, whether it's happened yet or not, where your primary mode here is hearing for yourself hearing Yahweh's voice for yourself. And I don't think there's enough people in the pulpit. <laughs> I think that whole way that structure set up is unscriptural, but for those people going to church still, I don't think there's enough people in the pulpit telling you, you need to be hearing for yourself because if that was happening, I think a lot of those guys in the pulpit probably wouldn't have a job because what you were hearing would be different than what he's saying. <laughs> well, well, anyway, more than that, you know, if, if, if we are drinking from the well of, of, you know, pure water, pure, the pure spring, the living water is, is welling up within us where we're hearing the father, we don't need to go and, and pay money to drink out of somebody else's polluted well. Yeah. Uh, and they're all polluted in some form or manner. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, I find it just more um, satisfying to get it right from the Father. But one of the uh, uh, you know what I, I think I think that's such a great point. And when when you first experience that, where He gives you an insight that uh, the, the crazy ones are where it's stuff that's just like right in front of me, like and it's been there forever. And then all of a sudden, He opens my eyes to showing me exactly what it really is and how to look at it. The first time, and I don't know about you, Harl, but the first time that happened to me, it made me extremely aware of a couple things. One was, we have no idea how blind we are. We just, no idea. And if you don't know how blind you are, then you probably don't even know you're blind. So when you have no idea that your reality is completely false, that's a big problem. And then the other thing is how clear he can make something in an instant like like it's it i, I remember the first time I, I i could not believe the depth of clarity and understanding at his leisure i, I mean the first time it really happened i was driving down the road when it happened there was nothing that was immediately preceding that that would have caused that to be an event but when it happened i just could not believe the difference in that understanding I was given at that moment in time on that particular aspect of something uh, compared to what I had on it just prior to that. And it was like that. And, and when you have some experiences like that, you, you, it really causes you to question what you believe is truth and, and, and operating on that from that being the basis of, your reality and when you start realizing that your reality is not based on truth that's i think the starting place for where you know things can get real right because because if you're if you're still playing the church game if you're still you know playing that i i i'm i'm good i'm covered i said the prayer you know i i do my service whatever your your framework is but deep down you know you're not hitting it at all then I think this is a good place for you. <laughs> well, the reason I, I came to this particular um, article, uh, I started, I 
actually in the Brit Hadashah or the, the New Testament. And I began to see the several places where Yeshua would speak the words, um, no man knows the, the day or the hour, and then just several places where he would say, no man knows. And in that, in, in researching that, I came across the uh, Hebrew idiom for Yom Teruah, which is the day that no man knows. And the, and, and the reason that it, that it is uh, called that is because, like I said before, nobody really knows when that crescent is going to appear, when that new moon will appear. And so uh, no, no man can, can know that. Let, 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 you know, we're winding down here, but I, I want to take this as a perfect example of something that's been completely misconstrued. So you just took this concept of no man knows this time and out day and hour based on a logical reoccurring situation in Hebrew culture that makes sense of a lot of things that need to be understood in order for scripture to make sense in context of what's happening in the new Testament or the Messianic writings, writings versus the, the Torah or the um, uh, Old original, Testament, original yeah, the original scriptures, right? In the original reading. So, so when you have this bridge and, and you take a piece of information where people go, oh, that's what it really means. And the reason I say that out is most times when you hear people talking about no man knows the, the day or the hour, they're future casting this into some prophetic event that is wrapped around Jesus coming back, right? Right. And but, and when, but uh, he, he didn't do that. He's yeah. he's what he's doing, he's it's it's a Hebrew idiom, and you find it throughout scripture. Um, when he's talking about the day that no man knows, he's referencing Yom Teruah. Um, and, and the way that he references it is, um, you know, when he talks about um, the, uh, you know, there'll be one, uh, there'll be two in the field, uh, one will be taken, one will not. When you understand that the doors of the city, and of course, the temple is within the city. So the doors of the temple, the, the doors of the city are shut every evening. Um, what you have in Judaism is they, they take the verse from Deuteronomy 19.15 about everything will be, um, will be um, established in the mouth of two or three witnesses uh, and they literally got two witnesses to stand on the walls of the city to um, uh, look for this crescent of the new moon and uh, to announce with the blast of a, of a shofar that it had um, arrived. Now, the reason why they're doing that is because the day, the Hebrew day, begins at sunset, and that's when the, the crescent would, would be um, uh, seen. Uh, and so they would, they would blow this trumpet, and there would be people in the fields working, and one would hear the blast and be emotionally taken by that and would leave what they were doing and would hasten to get back to the city so that they could be involved in the festivities. <clears throat> um, and another wouldn't, they'd continue, and they, would, they wouldn't prepare themselves, they would not have prepared themselves to make that journey. Um, again, you know, they, they, the ones that were prepared had their lamps, um, filled uh, with oil so that they could make it to the, to the gate, which brings us into the uh, parable of the, the 10 virgins. 
when um, the, the trumpet blasts, there's, there's five that are prepared and they go. I mean, all of this is just a re, uh, retelling of this same situation. <clears throat> uh, in, in, in John 9, 4, Yeshua says, you know, work while it is yet day, for night comes when no man can work. He's referencing he's this this Hebrew idiom that that is um, uh, going back to uh, the the day of of um, Yom uh, ter, ter, Terua and um, as I began to see this, then it, it led me back to the. Uh, to the um, Feast of the Awakening Blast, which is what it means. Uh, it could be a shout or it could come from a trumpet. But then I began to see where Rosh Hashanah, I too had been caught up in all of that. You know, I was, you know, celebrating something that wasn't legitimate. It was just the tradition of men. Um, and there are other there are other things in Judaism that have been corrupted by um, uh, their stay in other countries. Uh, the Hebrew, uh, yeah, I, you know, because we we do have to wind up. We're we've kind of gone a little bit over. But what I I want to point out, Harold, in all this of what you point out is. We, from my perspective, the biggest thing that starts happening as, you, as you're walking on this walk and you're getting clarity off what Yeshua was communicating and, and what he was modeling, and you get a framework of what Yahweh is wanting you to do and taking away all this man-made, you know, stuff that's been bolted on wrapped around is you start walking in a sense of freedom that you can never have any other way. Would you agree? Amen. Now it's not the kind of freedom that a lot of people think about and like freedom to do whatever I want, but people don't realize how many encumbrances are on in their life because they're walking in a self-effort-based modality all the time, and not, they're not even aware of it. It's like, God bless me, and then they go do their own thing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I know, uh, I know, I'm guilty, guilty. Uh, so anyway, but I, I think this is why I like, really, even though these articles are a little dry, you're not, for, I don't think a lot of people are going to get like this supernatural, external, revelatory kind of experience. But what I do think they do is they lay the foundation for knocking out a lot of pegs that hold up false doctrine that when you do take them out collectively, when you, when you wrap some of these other articles you write and you pull all this stuff together, it gets really clear and people have a much bigger idea of the big picture that they're walking into. So. Now, I want to, I want to finish this off by saying, you know, that I, I celebrate and recognize all of the feasts. It's just that I have seen that, the, that, that what Yeshua did when he elevated that temple from without from the physical temple without to within he you know he elevated it and in this in the same way these feasts are elevated in our lives i i don't throw a tent up in my backyard and go sleep out under the stars for a week because i am the sukkot i i don't have to run around and and throw things in the in the river as an atonement because he is my atonement and I embrace him every day. As we look into what these feasts are designed to to speak to us about and realize that as we embrace the Father, as we embrace Yeshua into our lives, we become those feasts. 
and that I, I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from this article is that I think a way that a lot of this feast they, they either get you know something is this is done this is passed or um, this is relevant we need to model them now as they were or this other aspect that you're talking about was these were shadows of things to come and now that they are here, we walk in them, and these were representational of those things that we are to walk in on a daily basis, right? Amen. Amen. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye.